Welcome to the Great Military Philosophers on Afghanistan. My name is John LeMay, and in this portion of the series, I examine my experiences in the war in Afghanistan through the lens of Sun Tzu's book, The Art of War. And now let's go back to Sun Tzu's framework and apply Sun Tzu's framework to the war in Afghanistan. So what I have here is Sun Tzu's framework applied to Afghanistan. So category, I've got the way, climate, terrain, command, regulation, U.S. and their allies, Taliban and their allies, and the final category over there is who has the advantage. Now when I first thought about this, I said, hey, U.S. Army, Taliban, advantage, and everything, U.S. Army, it's so clear. But as you step back a little bit, the U.S. military, the Army, the military, all of it, is actually over the last 18 years done a small fraction of the fighting. Most has been done by the Allies, particularly the Afghan National Security Defense Forces. So really, a fair assessment is the combination of the US, NATO, the Afghan National Security Defense Forces versus Taliban, Haqqani Network, Al-Qaeda, and any other terrorist alliances uh, that they've had working in Afghanistan. So it's really comparing the US and allies versus Taliban and allies. Okay, jumping into it, the way. Strength, the US home front. Often, uh, people, including myself, say, we didn't apply the lessons of Vietnam. And that's not accurate. A much more accurate statement is, we only applied a few of the lessons of Vietnam. Uh, probably none of the counter counterinsurgency lessons, but shortly after the Vietnam War ended, a major step was taken to align the home front in a future war, which was to go to the all-volunteer force. So the draft was gotten rid of. And so the combination of September 11th, the American people watching the planes go into the towers, watching the towers fall, not having a draft, having just an all-volunteer force, and not having taxes for the war, has led to a very strong home front and support the U.S. for the war effort. So that's a strength. Uh, weakness is the Afghan people. Uh, frankly, we can't tell the difference between uh, the Taliban and anyone else in Afghanistan, especially other uh, Pashtun uh, tribal members. So the inability to discriminate. Also, the Afghan people, many of them do not support uh, the Afghan National Defense Security Forces or their government. So there's very low alignment there. I want to talk about this last point after I talk about the, the Taliban. So let me go over here and look at the Taliban and the allies. The first thing about the Taliban to really focus in on is that they are a Pashtun movement, an ethnic movement. Many categorize them as an Islamic movement. And that's, that's a little bit like saying that some... The analogy is not that great, but saying like some party, maybe it's rebelling against the United States and the United States is a constitutional movement, or some party that says that we're into the Constitution is a constitutional movement. Well, most all Americans support the U.S. Constitution. It has great buy-in across everyone. So what really are the differences uh, between the movement here? So going back to, again, not a perfect analogy, but going back to Afghanistan, everyone's a Muslim. Like, almost everyone's a Muslim. So saying the Taliban is Islamic movement, it's fighting all these other Muslims, doesn't, doesn't make much sense. Now, they do have a great origin narrative. The origin narrative of, hey, they were Tali students of Islam. And these students of Islam came across this great wrong, like warlords and bad actors doing terrible things to the people, and they applied Sharia law to make it right. And then the people elevated them into governance because they wanted security and wanted to uh, be ruled by these students. I mean, that's a great origin narrative, but really the Taliban are a Pashtun movement, an ethnic movement of the Pashtun people, primarily. So the strength they have is the Pashtun people. They have broad support uh, from the Pashtun people. The Code of Pashtun Wali is also something that helps align the people and the Taliban and makes them willing to die for a cause. So they have great strengths there. Weaknesses, all other uh, ethnic groups in Afghanistan 
if you go back before the U.S. intervention, when the Northern Alliance was battling the Taliban, that's loosely all other ethnic groups in Afghanistan against the Pashtuns. So, okay, so we talked about Taliban strength and weaknesses. Let's come back to this one, the overlay of a Western military system on Afghanistan. That is a huge weakness for the Afghan National Defense Security Forces. Okay, to sort of highlight this, let me tell you a story. And this story has happened many, many, many times in Afghanistan. And it goes that there's 30 Afghan National Security Defense Force soldiers out on a combat outpost somewhere, securing a line of communication, a road or something. They're out on an outpost. And three Taliban engage them and rout them. And so how do three rout 30? Well, the first thing to know about this little story is that that's 30 privates because all the Afghans that have been chosen to be officers and non-commissioned officers have used their position of privilege to go back to a larger, more secure base with more amenities and are not out on a desolate combat outpost. And that is, I mean, that's just how they've taken rank to their culture. It's about privilege, not responsibility. So the second thing to know is it's, you know, it's desolate. It, these outposts are largely HESCO barriers filled with sand. Uh, they have often in short supply. So it sort of sucks to be out there. And then the third thing is the way this, you know, the three Taliban show up and route these 30 soldiers is they'll probably fire a few shots to get their attention, but then they immediately go into having a dialogue with them. And it's a two-track dialogue. Um, the first track is with all the other people. And so I may have skipped over this a little bit, but the Afghan National Security Defense Forces are built from all parts of Afghanistan. So all ethnic groups, all geographic locations are brought together, made into a unit, and then sent somewhere you know, random in Afghanistan. And so to the non-local soldiers, you know, the Taliban will have the uh, dialogue of, hey, we've got a one-time special deal, get out of here, run away, and you get to live. If not, we're going to come back with 100 of our best friends and kill you all, all you foreigners, all you non pashtun ethnic, or people that are from a different part of Afghanistan. And so that's one narrative. And then with the... Uh, a few that are more local or have some sort of tribal connection. Like, hey, brothers, we have these cousins in common. We have these tribal affiliations in common. Why are you standing next to these foreigners, these other ethnicities, these people from other parts of Afghanistan and fighting us? Come and join us. And so what will typically happen is a few of those 30 will defect to the Taliban. The rest will run away. And it's a, uh, you know, three Taliban have routed 30 Afghan National Defense Security Forces. So, the way is not with the Afghan National Defense Security Forces. They're not aligned with their leaders, and they're not willing to die for their cause. Advantage, Taliban. Okay, climate. This case is a little bit more clear-cut. It's a very much a case of 21st century versus 12th century, and the advantage goes to the 21st century. The U.S. and NATO are an all-weather, all-climate, day-and-night force and have command of air and space. The Taliban is uh, tied to fighting seasons. It's very difficult for a guerrilla force to have any kind of sustainment in the mountains and of Afghanistan during the winter. I will point out though, they've improved through necessity, through having a uh, all weather, all climate, all season force come at them constantly and all weather, all seasons and all climates, they've gotten better, but still clearly an advantage to the US. Okay, terrain. So, strength for the U.S. is engineering capabilities, building roads, building lines of communication, and, and very importantly, command of air and space. Weakness, high altitude operations. Really, the Chinook is one of the only helicopters that can operate at altitude in Afghanistan. Uh, so, a lot of the inventory is challenged by those kinds of operations. But a more important weakness is just that we actually need those lines of communications. So it's great that we can build the roads, but we need those roads. There's a reason why the Ford operating bases are all in airfields, and we put a lot of effort into building roads and infrastructure. And that just sets up places for guerrillas to attack. 
So the weakness is we actually need those lines of communication. Taliban strength is sanctuary in Pakistan. It's a huge advantage. Now, many people, and, and you know, partially justifiably, are very upset with uh, Pakistan for providing this sanctuary. But it's important to realize that Pakistan and Afghanistan are a little bit artificial. I mean, really, what we're talking about is Pashtunistan. So there is Pashtunistan, and the Brits cut in half, and half of it went into Afghanistan. It's not all of Afghanistan, and half of it went into Pakistan. It's not all of Pakistan, but Pashtunistan got cut in half, and the Pashtun people don't really recognize that. They operate freely, and the fact that we're sort of tied to a fiction that there's Afghanistan and Pakistan works to their advantage. So the Pashtun people that happen to live in Pakistan provide a lot of support and sanctuary to the Taliban, who are Pashtuns. So that sanctuary is a great strength. Uh, they're acclimatized, they're able to live off the land and the population. So we compare all this, advantage, Taliban. Okay, command. The U.S. has professional militaries, NATO has professional militaries. We have a West Point to the War College. We have the non-commissioned officer corps, the envy of the world, the backbone of the U.S. Army. So very professional militaries. That's a weak, our strength. However, the weakness is the Afghan National Defense Security Forces leadership. They are very weak. They're not professional. And, and I'll just tell a little, another little story to sort of highlight this. So one of the most successful Afghan National Defense Security Force leaders was General Razak. Now, he was assassinated, and he survived many assassination attempts, but finally uh, the Taliban got him. But while he was alive, he was the chief of police of Kandahar, and he was very successful. And some of the things that made him successful is, one, because he was a police chief and not tied to this national army, he recruited locally. He could have tribal and local and ethnic uniformity. Uh, he didn't have to have all that uh, divorce formation operating together so he could be uniformed that way. Also, he went in on the cult of personality. His police officers all ran around wearing patches with a big picture of him on it. Um, can you sort of imagine like Patton's Third Army all running around wearing a patch with Patton's picture on it? It's not, it's not, it's not Western. It's not a U.S. military tradition to do things like that. But worked very well for Razak. So he had a very effective police force, to the extent that the Army Corps, the Afghan National Defense Security Force, like their Army Corps in Kandahar would get in serious trouble and be routed, and the Kandahar police, uh, sorry, not Kandahar, and Helmand would be in serious trouble, and the Kandahar police would, you know, go forth and save the, the Army in Helmand. Um, so his effectiveness just highlights the weakness of the rest of the Afghan National Defense Security Forces. They have very poor leadership. Okay, over here to the Taliban, strength. They have very strong leaders. Uh, they're, they have tribal affiliation, tribal uh, loyalty, code of Pashtun Wali. Uh, they work very well. And uh, they're, they're actually uh, committed to learning from the U.S., you know, at many points uh, in the war, we'll get excited about things like, oh, they've captured our night division, night vision devices. You know, they might develop a night capability, which in time they certainly did. But much more significant was downloading U.S. Army doctrine off the internet and reading it and applying it and using it. So they worked hard, learned from us, and became much more professional over time. Okay, t one weakness though for the Taliban is turnover and leadership. The leadership is highly targeted, and um, they, they took a lot of casualties. They had a high leadership turnover over the 18 years. Um, many leaders in the Taliban were killed. So here in command, advantage Taliban. Uh, I can't stress, you know, when you look at this, U.S. and NATO are great, but the vast majority of the force is Afghan, and, and the Afghan National Defense Security Forces had very poor leaders. Okay, regulation. So, again, U.S. NATO forces, very professional, very regulated. And, you know, there are some Afghan units, like the commandos, that are 
that are strong. And the reason they are is because units like the Commandos are supervised, trained, work closely with Special Operations Forces. So U.S. and NATO Special Operations Forces have their hands very much in them, and they've developed good forces there. So those are well-regulated. However, all other, as I've stressed, Afghan National Defense Security Forces are weak. Not regulated. They're a weakness. Okay, looking over here to the Taliban, their strength is they're very disciplined about guerrilla operations. They're able to live off the land, get sustainment from the people, move through the difficult terrain, and they're highly effective. Their weakness is they can't mass. So when they mass, then because the U.S. and NATO have command of air and space, we can identify them and destroy them. And that forces them to be in dispersed operations. If you want to sort of think about that, think about 88 days to Kandahar and how but when we started off the invasion, we basically just paired air power with the Northern Alliance. And the Taliban's quasi, you know, conventional force against the Northern Alliance's conventional force, when they met for battle, the U.S. just destroyed the Taliban conventional force from the air. So they can't mass because then they'll be destroyed. They'll be identified and destroyed. So they have to remain small, dispersed, guerrilla operations that are hard to identify. However, they're very good at mm -hmm. that kind of decentralized operations is what they're very good at. So again, advantage Taliban. So, yeah, so I'm saying Sun Tzu would say, hey, the Taliban's going to win. Now, the immediate sort of response is, well, okay, this is 2020. And it's also through a thick lens of my biases, my experience. Um, and so it's not the same as doing an assessment. And, and it's not, right? We're looking back over 18 years, 2020 hindsight. But I do think that some elements of this are absolutely fair to say, hey, we could have done this assessment using this criteria in advance. Like, we could have said, hey... Is a Western military system really going to overlay on Afghan culture while they're fighting a civil war, an insurgency, uh, while they're in combat effectively? Is that in the near term going to produce an effective force? That kind of discussion, analysis, and, and the answer being no, it's not, could have been looked at before any serious involvement. We didn't need 18 years of hindsight to sort of come to that conclusion. Another one, uh, sanctuary in Pakistan. Shouldn't be a surprise to anyone before this thing really kicked off that Pashtunistan straddles both Afghanistan and Pakistan and that the Taliban are Pashtuns and they're going to get a lot of support from there. So I think that could have also very fairly been done without 18 years of experience in hindsight. Um, so yes, this is a 2020 exercise, but I think elements of this could absolutely be done without any hindsight. Okay, talked a little bit about applying Sun Tzu's assessment framework from his first chapter to the Afghan war. Okay, and now let's go ahead and conclude.